Thank you for joining us for another Hagley History Hangout. I am Gregory Hargreaves, Program Officer in the Center for the History of Business, Technology, and Society at the Hagley Museum and Library in Wilmington, Delaware. Now, during these history hangouts, we like to bring you some of the most interesting and innovative research being done using the collections at the Hagley Library, and especially um, the work being done by scholars who receive support from the Hagley Center. Uh, one such scholar joining me today is Dr. Nicole welk Yorger, um, a HMEI postdoctoral fellow at Princeton University. And uh, we're going to discuss her book project, Rumen Nation, an environmental history of the United States. Nicole, thank you so much for speaking with me today. Thanks so much for having me. That's great. Uh, let's sort of dive right into your topic. What are, is it that you're writing about? Yeah, so, um, so Rumen Nation, <laughs> it has a lot of different combinations connotations to that term and that mm. idea. But for those of you who don't see it visually, it's rumen as in ruminants <laughs> and then nation. Um, and I'm thinking a lot about uh, cattle in the United States. Um, one question that has really been bugging me and I think bugging a lot of environmental studies scholars and environmental historians is, is the place of cattle in the US, particularly in the future of the United States. Mm. Um, in questions of sustainability. Should we be consuming beef? Uh, should we be rethinking how cattle farming operations should be working on the surface? Um, and this has been a question that's been bugging me since at least when I was uh, completing my master's research. Um, I worked with Amish dairy farms uh, in uh, Pennsylvania and Maryland and in Delaware and New Jersey. Uh, they were kind of spread out quite a bit, but. Uh, working with those dairy farmers, the question of sustainability kept on coming up. And they were worried about keeping their farming operations afloat as more cattle operations were getting larger. Amish operations have to be quite small because of the rhetoric and the um, how Amish think about their lifestyle, which is very much the plain Anabaptist conservative lifestyle. The or so none. They only have, yeah, they only have like 40 cattle. Um, mm cattle operations that were not on the around them, growing to 100, 200, sometimes even 1,000 cows. So mm -hmm. they're worried about sustaining their businesses, but they're also worried about all of these um, concerns, particularly from um, places like the Environmental Protection Agency, of what the manure of their cattle is doing to waterways and what it's doing to the soil. Um, and all of these pollutants that are coming from these operations. So I saw this dual um, issue of sustainability come up in that community. And as I branched out my research ethnographically to non-Amish farmers, this is the same question that keeps um, plaguing the industry. Hmm. Um, and if you talk to any consumers, some people are gonna be vegan or vegetarian and they talk about sustainability and environmental issues. So when I got to my, um, my doctoral dissertation, I was interested in how those issues got filtered in through the feed industry. So this animal feed supplemental network that's not using grazing, tech, um, uh, grazing techniques necessarily or is using them in a limited capacity, what's going on in feedlots, what's going on with feed companies, and um, how are they contributing to this narrative or not? So that was the gist of the dissertation. But as I finished that work and research, I noticed that I was really interested in sustainability rhetoric. So mm -hmm. the book project, Rumination, is talking about this debate that keeps on coming up. And it's been coming up since the 19th century, probably earlier, but I start in the 19th century of what is the role of cattle in environmental sustainability, and the sustainability of certain livelihoods, as well as the sustainability of certain businesses, mm -hmm. and how that's all linked to how people are imagining what the United States is, <laughs> um, what you can do here, mm -hmm. and, and how it's all wrapped up in that. So I, I'm going to be expanding a little bit more um, with that book project, incorporating my ethnographic work with my historical work, um, but it's a messy, mud, muddy mess, <laughs> and I'm trying to talk a little bit about it in this book. <laughs> yeah, it is a, a big topic, it sounds like. Mm -hmm. um, let's perhaps start with your dissertation research then. Um, could you 
tell us a little bit more about the cattle feed industry, its broad outlines, um, and then perhaps its implications in your work. Yeah, so um, the cattle feed industry, um, the, the history really starts in the mid to late 19th century. Uh, when we're talking about cattle feed, we've always been feeding cows different types of things. <laughs> um, mm. And you can call those supplemental feeds. Um, so not only are cattle grazing, they do very well on grasses, but we've been giving them table scraps. We've been giving them a whole bunch of different types of fodder over the many centuries we've been living with them. But the feed industry as it exists in the United States today, that really got built in the late 19th century. And it was related in part to the milling industry. Noticing a lot as the milling industry is growing and growing, grounding up more materials and grains for a growing population. Um, this is very much like reductionist in how I'm describing this. It's a little bit more complicated, but mm -hmm. as growing crop population, milling industry is really in the boom. They're seeing there's a lot of waste in these milling industries as well as processing industries like the molasses industry. Mm -hmm. And these companies are seeing that they can capitalize off of this waste product by feeding it to animals mm -hmm. and working with agricultural experiment stations and agricultural colleges during this time where they're also building a rapport in the late 19th and early 20th century, they notice that these wasteful things can actually be processed pretty well in certain types of animals' bodies. Mm -hmm. And rumens are really interesting and it becomes a whole discipline of science and is part of the it was part of the dissertation and then into this book project people being fascinated by rumens and how they can convert wasteful materials into valuable ones um, so the feed industry um, really harnesses on this scientific language to legitimize mm. itself and farmers eat it up. They, they love having this data, they love having this evidence, and then experimenting on their own farms to see that supplemental feeds do help in a way at least produce more meat and milk products. Um, mm. But the problem then becomes, do you spend a lot of money on feed to get this, to this, get this profitable material? Or are there other ways and combinations of feeding your animals that are possibly more ecologically ecologically beneficial as well as economically beneficial. Mm. So um, for areas uh, like the Newark, Delaware region um, and Pennsylvania and New Jersey and New York, which I've focused a lot of my research on the Northeast here, the Mid-Atlantic region, um, there's a lot of different implications to this. The, one of the things that I found most interesting in my research is how the chemical composition of the soil and water Mm -hmm. changed with the manure of these animals as they were eating more things from the Midwest, where a lot of this material was being processed and then shipped over. Um, I found some really great uh, letters uh, by in the William DuPont collection where they're writing to uh, the mills in Purina, at Purina, which is in the Midwest, being like, where are my carts of feed going to come in from the, um, from the trains? Uh, the Midwest to the, the Northeast. And this is in the very early years of Purina's uh, company industry, um, company history. So this is that like really, um, really speaking to how these business relationships and partnerships and these adoptions that farmers are making are having also material consequences mm -hmm. on the ecology of the area. And it's such a problem today that talking to some scientists at Cornell University in New York, um, they're encouraging farmers to try and get down to the roots and make forages on, the own, on their own soil to create more of an organic system because of these chemical pollutants that are coming from, in some cases, around the world nowadays because of the feed industry. So, um, so it has um, some economic and entangled ecological consequences that I'm seeing and trying to disentangle in my work, but it's all based on how people are thinking about the cow or cattle as a viable, um, important resource for food, um, as well as for companionship, which I don't think is always uh, pulled out in some food history stuff. Hmm. 
And and now uh, these are some of the largest corporations in America. Uh, mm -hmm. Some of these feed milling companies, Cargill comes to mind, for instance. Oh yeah, and Cargill is huge. Um, Cargill and Purina have been quite the focus mm -hmm. for me, but there are all these little tiny feed companies as well um, that are related or then get kind of uh, eaten up by these larger industries, uh, or larger companies over time. So, um, but for a long time, there are th these really tiny um, feed offshoots uh, across Delaware and Pennsylvania where they had their own little milling operation and then sold that feed. Um, but of course the business model certainly changes <laughs> through the 20th century. You see it um, through the 19th century with railroads, very similar hierarchical management structure mm. happens uh, mm. with the feed companies as well. Now, when you were at the Hagley Library, what collections were you able to dig into to help you discover or rather uncover some of this history? Yeah, so the William DuPont and William DuPont Jr. collections are fantastic because if people listening to this didn't know already, the DuPonts had their own farms, they loved their cattle, they loved being part of the like up and coming cattle industry, whether it be dairying or beef, and they kept meticulous records, wonderful records. <laughs> um, the receipts, they seem really boring, but they're not. These feed receipts, every month, how much supplemental feeds and grains they were getting. Mm. Since the early 20th century, I went through all of those and just found some amazing letters and amazing receipts that talked about and showed what animals were eating, as well as what kind of how the DuPonts kind of thought about their farming businesses. And mm. they, they were recreational, but they were also businesses too. A uh, fox, fox catcher livestock, they, they had some issues when they were trying to expand on their beef operations. And you can see some of that in these records, um, see some challenges with feeding and trying to change different feeds. And at the same time, those records are being um, collected um, However, the, the DuPonts or however the, the Hagley saves these, a lot of materials are agricultural college publications, as well as um, just kind of like advertising from other agricultural businesses that are kind of mm. stuck in the middle of these receipts. So those are really nice to see, and they're really robust in the William DuPont collection. I, I got really interested in a DuPont's creation of urea, mm -hmm. which it's, it's called useful urea. There's other scholars who've been doing research on urea and plastic making and you name it, urea was used to make it um, all the way to pharmaceuticals. But they also, DuPont <laughs> sold it as an animal feed as well. So there are quite a few little snippets of various different types of collections. So the DuPont exhibition photographs and those exhibitions mm. that they, they built together, they had some stuff in there. Um, the DuPont executive committee minutes, I mm. went through those <laughs> to try and pull out material. Um, and then just like uh, the, the public relations PR um, records that they have talking about 262, which was this DuPont urea feed additive that they sold through the 1950s and actually still sell today, but is not called 262. It's just a urea additive that then gets mixed in with uh, feed company supplements mm -hmm. today. So I got really interested in that. And so that kind of broadened my horizons of the different collections I was in at the Hagley. But boy, oh boy, beautiful advertisements stark colors, reds and yellows they were using to advertise this feed. And how they talked about the cows and cow guts is just absolutely fascinating for the 1950s and 1960s. It was great, great work. How, how were they conceptualizing the digestive tract of cattle? My gosh, they were thinking of them like like factory workers. So the the ruminant gut they thought of as a factory, which this kind of rhetoric, it's existed for a long time to think about the whole cow body. And that's something that's really fascinated me. Purina had always called the cow's body a factory. Mm -hmm. And then the organs in that body are the workers. 
by the mid 20th century, there was more and more research done on the ruminant gut, but they were talking about the microbes in the stomach. Mm -hmm. So when you look at the 262 rhetoric and how they're talking about how does urea work in a ruminant stomach? Because spoiler alert, ruminants are the only livestock animal that can actually process urea as a chemical. Oh, the, one second. Yeah. What exactly is a ruminant? <laughs> so a ruminant, I'm sorry. Let I'm, me I'm sorry that. to interrupt, but yeah. It's like related to the whole rumination story, right? right? <laughs> a ruminant is a, a ruminant is an animal with a four-chambered stomach. Uh, or some people shorthand say they have four stomachs rather than a monogastric system, which is just one uh, stomach. Hmm. So ruminant guts are really interesting because the way that the they have a different um, microbial community that hangs out in there, <laughs> they can regurgitate their food and that helps with the digestive process. But also as it moves from one chamber to the next, the way that that food is converted into energy is quite different than with mm. monogastric animals. I see, I see, okay. And so urea is nitrogen. <laughs> and when it was working with these uh, microbes that are found in cattle and sheep stomachs, mm -hmm. they, um, they, they noticed that it actually helped with production gains. And what that means is you could sprinkle a little bit of urea into a feed system. Into, sorry, my dogs are barking and they're not happy right now. Um, I am, do you mind if I just like take a break? Oh, sure, I, I, I can pause this one moment. I don't know if you. <laughs> so okay. I was talking about ruminants, four chambered stomach, urea is nitrogen. It's mm -hmm. interacting with these microbes a little differently. Um, what it means when they're able to, to process it with gains is you can sprinkle a little bit of urea into a feed ration, and that actually can supplement some of the protein that you would get from another grain. Mm. What that means is that, um, and this is where the sustainability logic and rhetoric and writing that I'm interested in comes from, uh, they kind of love the dogs, right? <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, um, what that means is you can actually save on grain. And you don't have to use as much grain. So there's this, this idea that you're, you're saving a little bit more land, you're saving a little bit more food for another animal. That animal that's eating the urea is able to make more milk or meat with less feed. And so this logic of efficiency gets wrapped up in ideas of sustainability. And you see this really clearly with DuPont's language and advertising. And for them to then talk about those microscopic organisms in a ruminant gut as the little workers of a factory, which is, mm. is the rumen itself, to make the food of the planet and to have that food produced efficiently, more efficiently with urea, absolutely fascinating. <laughs> um, so that's that's the stuff that I was really excited to, yeah. to find in the archive. It ties together very neatly uh, the different strands that you're following here. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's kind of the keystone cornerstone of some of the big developments that happen in the 50s that then impact what happens 70s through today. Mm -hmm. So if you ever see those advertisements or those little like memes that are talking about how you can feed cattle seaweed and it produces less methane and you know worrying about climate change and these sorts of things. That science, a lot of that was actually funded by DuPont <laughs> in the 40s and 50s for their urea product. So that's the stuff that I'm uh, trying to tie together. Oh, what else has been used as a feed additive um, but besides grains? Mm -hmm. um, perhaps that might surprise, surprise us to hear. Um, Man, so I was talking about the processing plants earlier. Mm. There was a lot of sugar and molasses, mm. black, black strap molasses. That's actually used across animals, not just ruminants. Um, cookie meal, uh, bread meal, stuff that, so in all these processing plants where they're um, making various different baked goods, chocolate mm. plants, they're feeding any kind of waste or residue that can't be sold to the human public, to animals. Mm. Um, I see. And, yeah, and some of the feed companies that I worked with, they coveted 
cookie meal and cocoa meal and all of these types of things because animals are drawn, livestock animals in particular, are drawn to sweetness, much like we are. Um, mm-hmm. And it makes them in many ways, if you mix it in with their feed, makes them eat more. And it goes mm-hmm. with that efficiency rhetoric. Again, you eat more, you produce more. Great, happy dairying or beef operation if they're eating a lot. Um, other things probably know this history if anyone's tuning in with thinking about cattle in particular. Um, antibiotic waste has been used for a very long time in cattle feed um, since the 1950s. It's interesting though because when you disentangle the different types of antibiotics, some worked better than others. And that's because the ruminant gastrointestinal system is different from pigs and chickens. Um, DES, um, diethylstilbestrol, is uh, another, it's the hormone that was uh, fed through the 50s, 60s, and 70s, uh, produced by Eli Lilly. That's an interesting history, too, because it was an implant for chickens that they placed in their necks. And that was a whole big thing. If you consumed a chicken with this implant in their neck, uh, there were carcinogenic uh, problems with this. Uh, With cattle, it's fascinating because they made DES into a feed product that they could, again, like urea, just sprinkle on some feed and it helped with gains. Mm -hmm. And because it was a feed product, it was harder for um, the FDA to later ban it because there was this argument that the gastrointestinal system filtered out those carcinogenic and toxic properties that would get into meat, milk, or into the soil through manure. So those are the kinds of um, additives that I'm, I'm looking at and how that, that narrative changes a little bit because of the ruminant and gastrointestinal system, because there's something that's unique about it that people grab onto that they get so excited about that maybe, maybe livestock can eat these weird things. Maybe they can have hormones, antibiotics, and weird plastic making nitrogen. and and produce meat and milk more efficiently in the long run and also not get us sick and not get the environment sick. Mm. Does it happen? Does it happen that way? Not exactly. (laughs) But the way that people are interpreting data, that's the thing that I'm so interested in pulling out with my work. Mm. It's how people are looking at this data of how we're feeding animals and using that to make an argument for sustainability and the future of our world one way or the other way. And because it has to do with food and producing food and producing viable proteins, animal proteins for people, it gets complicated. And again, like I said, muddied and messy um, when you're following it to today. And how do you marry your uh, ethnographic work along with this uh, archival work? Yeah, so methodologically, I... I follow people and I follow commodities and ideas and animals. So I I follow what I do with my ethnographic work is I listen to what my informants are telling me and they'll say something like, this has always been the case. And I question it and I go, has this really always been the case? And then I use that question in the Mm. archives. So there's a lot of, when I'm marrying my historical and my ethnographic work, I see it as totally connected because my informants are then informing how I do my historical work. And then my historical work is informing how I then do my ethnographic work. When I then go onto a farm and I watch a cow eat, I can then kind of get a sense of, oh, this is what they were talking about when they talk about this behavior or their concern about this behavior in these Mm. weird scientific instruments that they were using with cattle. So it's helpful to interact with that animal to get that sense. And then it's also helpful to talk to the farmers and getting a sense of they, they, there, there seems to be a naturalization of how these practices have been adopted. And so often uh, it's, it's funny because then my ethnographic work more recently, it's me coming back to my informants and talking about what I found in the archive. And I have a true conversation with these farmers and these feed company specialists. Mm-hmm. Like, well, I found out that this was actually developed in the 1920s. It, it wasn't earlier. It was actually a little bit more recent than you're thinking. Does that change how you think about this? 
And they're like, well, no, or, oh yeah, that really does. And so when I'm writing the actual document itself, what I've done, what I've tried to do is use my ethnographic vignettes to introduce my line of questioning, my research questioning that then shows how I found this historical material. Because anytime we're doing historical research, we're driven by questions or key words, key terms, ideas. Sometimes we might be um, driven by place. I know you're really driven by place in your own work. Um, I'm driven by the farmers that I interact with and the feed company specialists that I interact with. Does this make the document look a little different? Yeah, absolutely. It makes my research look a bit different, um, but I'm really proud of it because it makes it feel very collaborative in a way that um, I don't know is always the case for a lot of historians to get that opportunity. Right. It, oh, it, when we're in conversation with people who've been dead a very long time, it, it can be difficult. Yeah. That does mean the stakes are a little different because some of the people I, I mean, they're alive <laughs> and what I write does matter. Um, so it does, um, writing about dead individuals versus living individuals and the politics of that is something that I'm mm. constantly thinking about mm. um, because there, there are stakes in how I tell this story and who, what narrative that aligns with. I'm trying to be as neutral as possible, which might frustrate some people as I'm writing about this very polarized topic. Mm. But I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm indebted to my informants in some way to tell the story as they see it and then mm. show a flip side using the primary source documents um, as, as my foundation. So that's what I'm trying to do. Perhaps you could speak a little bit to um, the current moment and its politics and controversy over this issue, um, particularly if you, if there are alternatives you could describe to the system of ruminant feed that um, that you just outlined for us. So there are many, many alternatives um, when we're thinking about the future of the cattle industry. Uh, and the big question that uh, experts are having right now are, is, um, do we need to be producing as much meat as we are now mm -hmm. for the future, or do we need to be producing more? And so this question really guides a lot of those debates right now, where there is this argumentation that the world population keeps on growing, they need more viable protein, there's this argument that uh, animal proteins process differently in human bodies than um, uh, other types of proteins like from mm. legumes or from vegetables. Um, and so you're, you get to these like really nitty gritty debates and arguments. And they often, when we're looking at the farmer side are trying to justify the cattle feeding operations as they exist today. And it's clear from the data that we, probably can't have that um, for the foreseeable future. We need to find a way that's either gonna hybridize different types of methods or start to move away more conscientiously away from animal proteins. So one, one thing that's been talked about quite a bit is uh, grazing and trying to get back to these grazing and hybrid roots, smaller farms, farming operations, um, thinking before the feed industry became the big feed industry time of feeding cattle. Um, the argument then becomes, well, these are smaller operations. They're not going to feed that growing population of people that we were talking about earlier. But that the system that we have right now, this very, um, this very intense, uh, intensified system uh, relies on feed companies. So this is where you're seeing, it. you can tell as I'm like hesitating and trying to talk here, is that this is a system that has um, created a network between a lot of different companies that have a lot of power today. Um, and that's guiding the conversation that we're having today when we're thinking about the future of our feed and food systems. Um, when I'm thinking about the farmers I'm working with, they're doing a lot of things that are working within the system rather than changing the system as a whole. So some of the things that they're doing is they're thinking of different feed supplements. I talked about the seaweed earlier. Um, there's also this other feed additive called 3 -Nop where they're trying to um, create chemical additives that will then help with methane emissions in particular. 
or hmm. change the chemical composition of manure so it's not creating this like really excessive pollutant issues that I was talking about earlier that um, scientists at Cornell are doing fantastic research on. Um, so looking at feed rations and trying to be very mindful of how these chemicals are interacting with one another is one thing that a lot of farmers are doing. Rethinking their operations as they're thinking about manure management when it's related to feeding. Um, yeah, and, and a lot more of these hybridized systems that are looking to the past and also to different cultures and communities that have often been, been long overlooked by companies mm -hmm. like the indigenous nations of the United States who have been here for quite some time. They were doing some cattle rearing in the West, looking at those practices and rethinking how cattle operations can happen in the future of the US. Um, I touch on that a little bit in my project, but it's not the, the foundation of it. Um, these, these are the things that we're thinking about for the future. So I can't say what's best. I can't say what's gonna be like the end all be all. I have colleagues that are like, it's gonna be lab grown meat in the future. That's the way that we're going to get away from this. Or um, some say we're going to do away with animal proteins altogether and we're going to be a um, vegetable based uh, society from now on. I. I think it's gonna be more complicated than that. And it's gonna be swayed not only by businesses that exist today, um, but also by consumers and by the producers that have these long standing relationships, particularly in rural America to livestock, to agricultural life and work, to 4-H clubs and FFA organizations. They're thinking about these things differently and they do make up a lot of that debate that's happening today. Mm. Um, so that's that's where it is now. The cattle are doing quite a bit of ecological damage in various different ways to the world today. But the solution I think in the future is going to be hybrid. I hope, I'm, I'm hoping I don't sound too optimistic, it will be collaborative mm. and will, but it will probably be slow. And the question is, do we need the action now to, to save our planet during the climate crisis? Or do we have some time that we can create these new models and methods and have those integrated into the systems already in place? I don't know. Right. Um, what role does public subsidy have to play in this? Mm. Yeah. So. When we're thinking about subsidies, I'm, I'm assuming you're talking about like farm subsidies from the government. Sure, uh, exactly. Yeah, so uh, the government has been buying a lot of milk for a long time in the history mm -hmm. of dairying, mm -hmm. buying meat, they, buying corn subsidies, all of these things that yes, this is definitely integrated into this story. Um, and it comes out of, I think, this going back to the, the idea of beef and milk being not just important products, but valuable, desirable products that speak to the um, identity of the American public. Um, Chris Deutsch does some really great work on this front. And he has a, a book coming out. I think it's called like Red red democracy and red meat democracy, something like this, but Chris Deutsch's work, he's doing a, a book project on this, um, some of this rhetoric in the mid 20th century. Mm -hmm. But um, but yes, yeah, so when we look at that being all tied together, those corn subsidies, the milk, so it's like, it's, it's as if the US government has been trying to regulate itself by buying both the feed product and the, the end product. But the, they're the main consumers of this material, not necessarily the actual eating public. So this is something that's really difficult to pull out in a lot of the data that we have, um, because people are not um, anything that has to do with nutritional research. It can be a little murky because we change our minds every day. We have quite a bit of choices when we're thinking about what the consuming public is 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 eating. We we have rough numbers, but when we're talking about how people are thinking about beef and milk um, and eating it, 
it's a bit different than how the government's talking about it. So, but the government is also like very much, it's very much believing that beef and milk are still really important products for the American public. So that is informing what businesses are winning out over the years. That is informing which farmers are getting bailed out over the years. Um, it's predominantly larger operations, white farmers in the United States context. Um, and, that, and that is important to highlight. Mm -hmm. And because that is speaking to how one part of the narrative is being told. And one way we might be able to address the larger issue. Absolutely. I have one last question for you. Um, how are you expanding your horizon, so to speak, as you translate your dissertation into a book? Mm -hmm. So when I wrote my dissertation, I was in a history of science department and I felt like I needed to prove that I was a historian. <laughs> in many ways. Um, I went from uh, being an anthropologist during my master's degree. I did this ethnographic project with the Amish. I then transitioned to this history department. I'm like, I gotta prove that I'm a historian. So a lot of my ethnographic work, I was really hesitant to weave it into some of my chapters in my history dissertation. So I had some ethnographic work in the beginning, some in the end, maybe a little parsed in between, but it didn't, um, it didn't really get highlighted in a way that I had hoped it would uh, in the finished product of my dissertation. Now, there were other elements to that. I also defended during a pandemic. <laughs> so that affected some things. Um, but overall, um, what the book project will be doing is I will be integrating more of that ethnographic material. It will very much uh, be part of how I'm writing the piece. I'm going to be adding chapters <laughs> that are focused on more different kinds of feed additives. Mm -hmm. And I will also be expanding a little bit more on this thread that I just needed to digest a little bit more, pun intended. <laughs> I need to digest um, rural communities and how they're thinking about their livestock and how it's attached to this larger, um, a lot of it is, is Christian religious rhetoric. And I am influenced a bit by my Amish work, but as I was looking into some of the primary sources at the Hagley and other places I visited, there's this, wonderful, interesting, fascinating religious rhetoric that's talking about hope and the ruminant gut. And the ruminant gut's not just a factory, it's also this place where in this space of uncertainty, we, we can see that it's going to filter things out. We don't have all of the data, but it's going to filter out these toxins. We can feed this because it is that cattle are a part of the future of our food systems. And so the book project will be playing with that a little bit as well when thinking about sustainability rhetoric. It's not just the science and the efficiency and, and this evidence that they're pulling out of all these spaces. It's also this, um, this rhetoric from the church, this discussion from the church of hope and the future and, um, and how the cow is in the middle of that. So I'm still, I'm still chewing on that bone. Um, but it is uh, coming up in some of the ethnographic pieces that I'm writing into the book project right now. And it will be either I will make some stunning claim connecting everything seamlessly, or I'll let the reader kind of tie things together because this is a really, um, there, there's a lot going on in this discussion, but I wanna put it all out there because I think they are interconnected. Even if I can't completely uh, finish my my thoughts on on that at this very second in time <laughs> maybe a week from now maybe a month from now but yes well I think we can leave with the image of the sacred cow uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, in everyone's mind yes absolutely and Nicole thank you so much uh, for taking the time to speak with me today it was really a joy
Thank you. And I apologize to you and anyone who's listening or watching this for my very excited dogs who wanted to be <laughs> part of the discussion today. <laughs> well, they were more than welcome. And uh, for our audience, if you would like more Hagley History Hangouts or more information on the Hagley Museum and Library, why don't you join us online at www.hagley.org. That's H-A-G-L-E-Y.org. And don't be a stranger.